Good evening, everyone, and welcome uh, to January's Volunteer Forum here. I'm here at the uh, DMO Workshops uh, in Corio. Uh, we're broadcasting to you live, and it's a pleasure to have uh, everyone here uh, online with us uh, tonight. As usual, uh, tell me where you're from. Always very interested to hear uh, and know where our people are logging on from watching tonight's uh, forum. And we already have uh, a couple of people joining us, whether it be Craig from Hoddles Creek, Brendan from Greendale, or Kylie from uh, South Melbourne. So I think we've got some really great um, attendance tonight and a jam-packed agenda here at uh, Corio. I want to start tonight's forum by acknowledging the traditional owners uh, to which we're all meeting on tonight and pay my respects to Aboriginal persons past, present and emerging and recognise the strength and resilience of the Aboriginal people in this land. Uh, there is a big storm coming through uh, Geelong uh, very shortly, so I do apologise if, uh, if the rain on the rooftops uh, plays with the sound here, but we are hoping that it, uh, it will bypass us. But just in case it doesn't, just letting you all know that uh, there is a bit of uh, storm activity going on. Happy New Year. This is the first uh, volunteer forum for 2022 uh, and it's a pleasure to be able to recommence these uh, this year in an effort to uh, bring you the information that our volunteers want and provide the, the key updates to the programs and initiatives that the CFA are uh, undertaking. On the panel here with me this evening we have uh, Anthony Ramsey as always. Anthony, welcome. Uh, get ready for those hard questions. You know they're going to come. I'm sure Eric's sitting at home just thinking of a few right now just for you. <laughs> Uh, I also have Tim Smith here with me uh, and Karen, welcome to the panel this evening. Uh, we have two other people here sitting in the wings as always, ready to jump onto the panel and provide their expertise. Uh, and that's um, Stephen and John, and we'll be hearing from them uh, a little later on. Uh, there they are sitting there in the wings. Uh, we'll be hearing from them a little later on about some of the really great initiatives uh, that goes on. As always, questions are invited. We do want to hear from our members, ask the hard questions. Anthony's here tonight, so I am giving you the, uh, the challenge uh, to ask him the stumper, uh, but certainly we're going to answer any question we can. We have Brad here tonight. Brad's monitoring the internal comms email address. Uh, so if you do have a question, uh, please feel free to email that internal comms at CFA uh, and Brad will be able to read them online. Uh, online uh, or likewise I can pick up some of your questions uh, here in the chat so um, thank you thank you very much for joining us um, one of the things that I, I think for, for me uh, as I did my chiefs tour uh, last year and as I do talk um, to brigades uh, the DMO workshop is where it all happens uh, they tell me it's where all the things get fixed that uh, that do get broken and more importantly it's where all the latest gossip uh, gets to be known and we'll ask the boys later on um, what sort of gossip they do have on, on offer, because they tell me if it's worth knowing, a DMO generally does know it. So uh, that's uh, fantastic. It would be remiss of me not to acknowledge that yesterday, Australia Day, I uh, saw the release of the Australia Day uh, honours and awards, and particularly a number of CFA members were acknowledged with Her Majesty's Australian Fire Service Medal. And in particular, I'd like to give a shout out to John Clark, Graham Higgs and Gillian Metz, who were recipients of the AFSM medal. John, more than 50 years as a volunteer firefighter under his belt, has done multiple things and a fantastic contribution uh, to Seymour and his local community. After becoming a member at just the age of 16, well recognised in the local community and has dedicated a life of service uh, to the CFA. Uh, Graham, Graham is another long serving volunteer, uh, almost 50 years experience with the CFA and has had a significant leadership role including uh, during the 2009 Black Saturday fires. Distinguished service to Durham West Fire Brigade includes 20 years as captain and helping the transition from that rural type brigade through to one that responds to a range of hazards including uh, urban fires and incidents. And finally, uh, Gillian. Uh, Gillian joined the CFA in 2000 after moving to Australia from the UK uh, and uh, really did get into the local community spirit uh, and joined the CFA to understand what it's all about. And after participating in deployments and major incidents and leading strike teams, she had led pro programs and projects to address the areas of strategic improvement, uh, as well as championed increased diversity and diversity of, uh, 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 within the CFA in contributing to ensuring that local brigades become stronger brigades that better represent the communities that which we serve. And as many of us know, that's the future of the CFA, to make sure that as a community-based organisation, we're made up of the local community that we serve, and that ultimately leads to the, uh, to the benefits of the community and the brigade. So, Tim, we're here in Cryo, DMO workshop. 
number of these around the state? There is, there is. There's 13 uh, district mechanical officer workshops right across uh, Victoria, um, servicing uh, all, uh, all of our volunteer fire brigades. Um, so we've got uh, 75 DMOs across the state, uh, and they're supported by uh, a couple of uh, managers that, that manage each half of the state um, to support them. Um, and we've got some admin staff as well uh, on, a, on sort of a part-time arrangement that uh, support the workshops. And we've got 13 or so casual drivers that drive the trucks around from station to station so that the volunteers um, don't, don't have to do that work. And uh, that works really well. But uh, yeah, we're 13 workshops. We'll look after 2,282 or 83 wow. trucks for CFA. It's quite, a, it's quite a big fleet to sort sure. of bring in yep. and, and, and service and maintain. So what's, what are some of the trucks that we see coming through a, through a workshop? Uh, so we'll, we'll service all uh, fire trucks that have a... a, a uh, what, they, what we call a, a purpose-built um, body or purpose-built fire uh, capability. So most of uh, the vehicles that are not um, full command vehicles or, or uh, smaller vehicles uh, get maintained through our workshops. And um, you know, one of, the, one of the vehicles that we're getting a lot of attention about at the moment is the new ultra heavy tanker. Um, so that's, uh, that's one that we know now that we've got a program to build some more. Uh, and uh, and that's uh, becoming a uh, yeah, very popular truck for us out there. Excellent. Um, do we have a problem? Uh, Storm is probably the game connection. We're back live now. Okay, thank you. Uh, so apologies, uh, everyone. We're just, as I said, Storm, and we are running off uh, off uh, the wireless network. So uh, if, if you do happen to drop out, please uh, hit that retry button, refresh, and join on. We do apologise, but as I said at the beginning, there is quite a large storm cell over us that is playing a bit of havoc with our connection uh, here tonight, unfortunately. Um, so Tim, ultra heavy tankers, obviously uh, you know, one of the new approaching things. And we have Karen here with us tonight, who is the resident expert, I believe, in ultra heavy tankers. Can you tell us more about it? So currently we have two ultra heavy tankers, which we built uh, basically as a, as a prototype to, to get them out in the fleet to see how they, how they worked. and and so forth, and they've been doing um, some really good things up in districts 17 and 18. So that's where they're based at the moment. And we are looking forward to building another 29 of them. So. Awesome. Um, so what's, what distinguishes, I guess, the ultra heavy tanker to, to a heavy tanker? Okay, so a heavy tanker has 4,000 litres of water, our current heavy tankers. Uh, the new ultra heavy tankers are going to have 10,000 litres of water. So they are, they're on a, um, a six by four cab chassis, so they're a larger vehicle, they're a longer vehicle, higher, um, and a large amount of water, which allows them to go for longer before having to go back and refill, which is a, a big advantage in a lot of areas uh, where there isn't a lot of reticulated water. Yeah, and certainly uh, in my travels, particularly in the, you know, the Wimmera and some of those western parts of the state, water is quite important too. Uh, to the, the crews on the ground there and having a, a vehicle like this really will uh, boost that water carrying capacity um, but also the ability of the, the crews to operate uh, on, you know, on the ground. So it's certainly great, uh, a great improvement um, to the fleet. So um, how many of these are we we're looking at, at building? So we're going to build 29 in this next build. Uh, so that's, and they will be distributed right across the state, uh, but there will be, um, I believe, yeah, all, all over the state and in all the different regions. So, ah, excellent. No, that's, that's fantastic and it's great to, uh, great to hear and certainly I think um, we look forward to, to them getting out and about um, and, uh, and being able to uh, facilitate that, you know, the service that they do uh, to, to our brigade. So, Tim, Ultra Heavy Tank, you reckon you'll be able to fit one into the workshop here? Uh, absolutely, Up on the we will Yeah, no, we're uh, well, we're well, uh, we have the capability here at this workshop and, and all of our workshops to service the uh, the six by four ultra heavy tanker. It, uh, it uh, won't be a challenge for us, and uh, we're looking forward to keeping them on the road for for our volunteers. Yeah, excellent. I'm sure I'm sure you will all. Anthony, um, here in here in Corio, uh, the, the the workshop here, and we've just heard um, from from Tim about some of the great work that the workshops do do. But it's not just the CFA, is it? No. Um we, uh, we effectively still service uh, all, of the, uh, all of the vehicles that uh, were transferred to, uh, to Fire Rescue Victoria as part of reform. Uh, in this workshop in particular, um, we, do seem to, we do get to see a lot of uh, 
Fire Rescue Victoria vehicles come through, and it's uh, and it's great to be able to uh, to continue that um, to continue that service and uh, and uh, and help out the other agency by um, by looking after these these vehicles. I mean, we built them, we maintained them for many many years, and uh, and as a result, um, it's uh, it's logical for us to uh, continue to look after them at the moment while a, a decision on them you know for the longer term is made. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's fantastic. I think it goes to, to the strength uh, of the DMOs and the DMO network and the workshops that we are able to uh, to provide that service to, to Fire Rescue Victoria and be able to um, continue to service that uh, that fleet. So, uh, so tell me, Tim, do they break more trucks than our volunteers, or what's the story? Uh, <laughs> that, uh, it's a bit hard to say. <laughs> oh, the, always the diplomat. Um, so I think uh, given the, the numbers, I'm sure there's probably more CFA trucks going through these doors than fire rescue trucks. But I think it's fantastic that uh, you're able to, uh, to, to provide that to, uh, to fire rescue and ensure that we continue uh, to assist them in operating as, as they do too. Um, Anthony, uh, there is another vehicle we've got to, to talk about tonight. We've, we've spoken about the, the ultra heavy tanker, but um, there's this thing known as the BA support vehicle. So we're um, so as part of our uh, as part of our ongoing uh, work to to look at the uh, the broader BA strategy for CFA moving forward, we're looking at uh, at some light support vehicles. So we were able to uh, to build a couple of prototypes, and um, those um, those vehicles um, are there to uh, to carry cylinders and uh, and some other gear, and to uh, to help us be able to move um, those cylinder caches around the state. Um, as we need to, um, as we move to, as we move more to this, uh, more to, more to, to, to a different way of working with uh, breathing apparatus, and particularly with uh, swap and go type functionality for cylinders, and a, and a number of other initiatives that um, uh, that Act for Brett Boatman's looking at at the moment. Awesome, and I understand. I think uh, Keith tonight we've got a bit of a video on the uh, BA support vehicle, so uh, roll the tape. G'day, my name's Stephen Hill from CFA's Fleet and Protective Equipment Department. We're here to show you around CFA's newest concept vehicle, BA Support. This vehicle has been developed to support infield BA operations, training activities, and through the provision of BA cylinders, mask cleaning, and basic rehab for firefighters. Built on a 3.2 litre Ford Ranger XL Extra Cab with an automatic transmission, bull bar, snorkel, tow bar, all allowing to be driven on a car license. Being an extra cab, the seating is limited to two crew. Inside the cabin we have the CFA tape radio and the slick controller to operate all emergency lighting, scene lighting and locker lighting. Inside this locker we have facilities to wash BA masks, trestle tables, two comfort chairs, two BA staging mats, asbestos field kits and a BA pressure gauge. The vehicle is fitted with an under tray 70 litre water tank and 12 volt pump. These two valves are connected to the under tray water tank and is switched on and off using this pump switch here. Inside the rear locker is 24 BA cylinders, and the cylinders are kept in place by the locking tabs. This locker contains the dual battery and all associated punitry. Inside this locker we have a magnetic whiteboards, fire extinguisher, space available for contaminated PPC for transportation, CFA portable and charger. Across the bull bar we have the LED driving light, the green LED directly above the number plate, this will illuminate when driving under Code 1 conditions. This is a typical layout of the two trestle tables laid out to suit the incident. Three tubs, first for pre-wash, the second for rinsing and the third for drying of masks. BA staging mats, colour coded red and green to show full and empty cylinders. Two comfort chairs for crews for rest and recovery. Wow, what a fantastic uh, piece of equipment. And again, um, congratulations to all those people uh, within infrastructure services that have worked on, on that vehicle and putting it together, whether it be the design, the manufacture or the, or the commissioning, and certainly a piece of equipment that will uh, serve our volunteers well uh, as they go doing what they do best in service to their, to their communities. Um, just a, a point I have noticed in the chat, a lot of discussion about audio dropouts, video dropouts. Again, we do apologise. We do know there's a storm cell uh, playing some uh, havoc with our, with our connection equipment tonight, but never fear. Uh, the the uh, live stream is being recorded uh, and will be available on members uh, online after the, 
uh, after the workshop as well as I think Keith's going to be able to do with some of his magic, uh, be able to stitch it all together and again uh, have it available to people uh, afterwards. So uh, if you have missed something, if you did drop out, uh, never fear, you can go back and watch the entire thing without, uh, without the dropout. So um, just to, to fill you in on, uh, on that one, thank you. So we have a, a new panellist here with us. John, welcome uh, to, to the panel tonight. Uh, are you ready for, for the hard ones? Um, I'll give it a go, yeah. Give it a go, excellent. So you're the OIC in charge yep. of, the, uh, of the workshop here. Yep. What does that mean? What does that encompass? I just uh, uh, delegate the workload to the DMOs um, and uh, liaise between the, um, uh, myself and the volunteers out there uh, work that's done on their vehicles. Excellent. So uh, are you one of these people that knows what's going on, all the gossip? Uh, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, tell me, are the rumours true? If you want to know anything in this organisation, just ask a DMO. It's generally the, the generally the way we get around a fair bit, and um, yeah, normally um, the volunteers are up for a bit of a chat. So awesome! No, yeah. that's fantastic. It's great, um, great to hear. So tell me, um, I guess more about you know, the role, your role, the workshop, uh, and what it's what it's like to be in a day in the life of a of a district mechanical officer. Um, uh, our workshop's fairly fairly busy. Um, we look after uh, probably 60, around 60 brigades. Um, we uh, generally have got 170 vehicles that we look after, which keep it pretty busy all the time. Um, uh, our work, trying to get the workflow through is a, a bit of a challenge sometimes, especially at the moment with um, COVID and the like. Um, parts are getting a bit hard to get uh, come by, but um, yeah, generally it's a fast pace, um, a workshop to work in at Geelong for sure. Ah, excellent. Um, so I guess, what are, tell me, what, is, what are some of the most common things that come through the door here? Um, normally it's uh, electrical problems these days. Um, uh, years gone by it used to be a lot of driveline issues, but um, drivelines are a lot more robust these days and now we're looking at more uh, your electrical faults, um, stuff along those lines. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, excellent. And uh, they tell me the DMOs are fairly, fairly forgiving, and there's a bit of a no blame policy that goes um, on when the truck comes in, a little bit bent. It's yeah, it's definitely um, yeah, it's come to be expected. Yeah, you see where some of these trucks go. Um, they, it's inevitable that um, they're going to rub up, rub up against something. So, no, uh, do you ever sort of look at some of them and go? How did they do that? Um, uh, yeah, quite a bit. But <laughs> oh, so what about um, so you run a twenty-four hour a day, seven day a week, three hundred and sixty-five day operation uh, as, yeah. as a DMO. So what, what's it like, sort of organising that, and how, how do you, I guess you operate in the in the middle, you know, the dark or during major activities? And I understand. Um, yeah, we even sent DMOs to, to South Australia recently on, a, on, a, on an interstate deployments. Tell, tell me a little bit yeah, more about that. Um, well, one thing we are pretty good at doing as a, as a section is improvising, um, making good with uh, uh, very little. Um, used to working um, in isolated situations and um, making the best of, of uh, a bad situation sometimes um, and uh, just in order to get the um, the vehicles on the move again so mm, an invaluable uh, job and I know yeah. um, as I said before that other than knowing you know, if you want to know something go ask a DMO but I, I do generally think that you know our DMOs are probably a bit of unsung heroes in the organization behind the scenes uh, very very rarely sort of um, you know heard from and seen but you are so yeah. critical to ensuring that our fleet is uh, is always ready to respond uh, mm -hmm. and is able to um, to be there when our when our volunteers need it uh, need yeah. it most I had a bit of a tour of the workshop uh, when, I, when I first got here this evening. It's a fantastic workshop. Yeah. Um, some of the, there's some real key safety features here because I obviously, you know, working around heavy machinery, you know, lifting, or slips, trips, falls, those sort of stuff. You know, yeah. a lot of oil around uh, or potentially around. Uh, this yeah. workshop is immaculate. So uh, um, I, I, I'm sure someone would be, get upset with me saying a lot of oil around, but certainly. Um, yeah. Talk me through, I guess, some of the safety features and some of the safety initiatives here in the, in the workshop. Uh, well, it, it's all born from um, learnings from the previous workshops that have been built. This is the last one that has been built. Um, it's a 10 bay workshop. Um, the last um, the four bays are eight metres high to incorporate a five tonne crane 
and uh, fall assist um, equipment uh, for working on on uh, heights, working at heights. Um, it was uh, a lot different than the old workshop, which we would have seen earlier on, just a, a glimpse of. Um, they fit a, fit a fair bit more in. Um, we're able to run eight uh, DMOs out of the workshop, uh, one driver and one admin assistant, along with an apprentice. Uh, as you see, we've got two truck hoists there, um, which uh, help us from, uh, immensely with uh, doing the, all, all the uh, gearbox work and uh, diffs, that alight, that sort of stuff. Um, got, uh, yeah, plenty of room to move and as you can see we've got a, a fair bit of work ahead of us in the next week or so anyway. Um, as you see we've got Dale there doing a valve, um, delivery valve. Um, we've got the exhaust on the top left there, exhaust extraction unit for um, getting exhaust uh, fumes out of the workshop. Um, five, po uh, five ton hoist there for working on the four-wheel drives and stuff. That's made it a lot easier to work on those. We've got our uh, fabrication area there for, um, we've got TIG, MIG, um, plasma cutter, um, our oil store, uh, which is all bunted, all uh, EPA compliant. Even the shelving in that store is bunted. And it's got a well there to catch any anything that gets past the bunting, pretty much. And you've got the five-ton hoist, which has got um, a fall protection, the fall from heights equipment on it. Um, James is just demonstrating now the, the uh, equipment that we use, the harness and the like. Um, just to, uh, so when we're working on top of an appliance, um, if he does happen to um, accidentally f fall off, um, he's um, allegedly not going to hit the ground. So. No, it's all, it is all about safety. As yep. said, when, when you are dealing with heavy industry, such as yep. you know, mechanics dealing with, uh, with trucks and machinery, yep. it's important that we do uh, look after the health and safety of our people, wherever that be, a fall protection, as you spoke about, yep. you know, safe lifting practices, um, clean clean environment uh, and, right. the, and the like. So tell me, um, so we, we've seen obviously you know, on the video, um, your standard trucks, your, your heavy pumpers, your, your medium pumpers and the, and the like. What about a ladder platform, Bronto? Can you take yeah. care of one of them? We've um, yeah, recently completed uh, on a snozzle, uh, uh, 10 yearly on one of those. Uh, fully pulled it all down using the uh, crane, uh, refurbished it and put it all back together. Um, the city's 42 metre, we've, um, we have that in all the time and free monthlies, all the rest of it. Uh, we can set one of them up inside in the high bays which is a luxury because we used to have to set them up outside no matter what the weather and play with them out there. So it's um, a good asset having the room to be able to set one of them up inside. And, I bet. And, and um, I guess that leads me to, the, I guess, my little cheeky question to you was, um, so do you ever get out and have a bit of a play with the, you know, with the machinery and all that sort of stuff uh, in the interest of testing? There might be a few testing? photos. Oh, yeah, really? Yeah. Uh, I guess yeah. it, uh, you know, boys and their toys yeah. uh, comes to comes to mind. Look, I think that's, that's great. Uh, the workshop itself, and as I said, the work that you do, mm -hmm. and certainly from what yeah. I can see here, um, the chat is absolutely full of volunteers right now saying DMOs are our heroes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, they keep us going, uh, do some fantastic work. And in fact, uh, a couple of shout outs to, to those that did go to South Australia. So. Um, a lot of work being done and a lot of fantastic effort being put in by our district mechanical officers and support staff. It is a team effort yep. um, and certainly Definitely. one that I know uh, our volunteers are extremely appreciative of the hard work and dedication uh, of, of you all. So thanks, um, thanks for, for telling us all about it, John, and uh, giving us a little bit of an insight no into worries. what it's like to, to, to be uh, uh, in charge of a, a workshop uh, yep. and making sure that we look after the, uh, the CFA fleet. So thank you. No worries. Anthony? The people have not let me down tonight, Fantastic. and they've, uh, they've got There's a couple of hard, uh, well, a couple of interesting questions here in the uh, in the chat. Sure. Um, so Scott asks the announcement of heavy tankers indicated they were going to replace single cab trucks. Mm -hmm. Over half have gone to replace the current dual cabs. Why? Well, that's right. So, um, so yes, the uh, the the 48 heavy tankers and, and two lights uh, will uh, will replace through a series of cascades in some instances. Um, uh, single cab, single cab truck. So, at the end of that program, um, through a series of uh, of, of cascades, um, 
in a lot of cases we'll do a, a bit of a midlife uh, refresh of, uh, of some vehicles um, and send them uh, and send them to other brigades to uh, to end their um, to end their uh, their service at. Um, but at the end of the day, 50 single cab uh, heavy tankers will roll uh, will, will roll out of uh, out of CFA and uh, and be decommissioned. Thank you. Uh, Kevin asks, um, does the BA support vehicle have the facility to refill cylinders as well? No, it doesn't. So, um, so the uh, so the the capability we're focusing on is is moving cylinders around the state and, and being able to get to the uh, uh, being able to get to the point where cylinders can be filled, uh, cylinders can be uh, can be looked after at the most appropriate uh, at the most appropriate uh, existing facility in many cases. Um, that's not to say that there won't be other um, that there won't be other uh, compressors rolled out around the state, but at the moment. Um, what we're looking at the BA supports to do is to be able to move those existing cylinder caches around the state and take them to where they, you know, to where they're needed at a time. Um, once we've got the, the swap and go up and running completely, we'll basically take uh, you know 30 odd cylinders to a job if they're used. Great, they get loaded back up and they get taken back and, and looked after. Excellent. And probably the last one before we go uh, to our next, a uh, next panelist and, and subject. And, and I know you and I spoke about it after the last volunteer forum or the volunteer forum at Scoresby and that's that yep. little green light near the number plate. Uh, questions being asked about will there be a, a view to retrofitting those vehicles that don't have the little green light? And I guess for you some out have, there... You might have done it. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess for some of them out there, uh, I guess explain what is the little green light and how does it work? Yeah, I, I, maybe, that's the, maybe I can answer that and, and pretend that I answered the whole question, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, the little green light is used. It was it first started in the ambulance service um, because the way that our LEDs light, the way that our LED lights work um, is with the uh, with the flickering that they do. They're not always captured by cameras such as speed cameras or red light cameras. So it looks for all intents and purposes that um, that our vehicles are travelling either at speed or, or through uh, or through intersections or against red lights without their you know without their light showing because the cameras don't always pick them up. So the ambulance service introduced this steady green light sitting above both the front and rear number plate. Um, we've started, we've introduced that into our into our new um, into our new fit outs, um, but uh, we haven't uh, we haven't really explored um, a um, we haven't really explored a, a retrofitting of that. Um, we can we can certainly have a look at that, but uh, but at this point in time, there is no um, there's no plan in place for that. Okay, and uh, one final one just to yeah round it off. Um, Darren asks, as previously uh, asked before, is any plans to, retro, to plans to fit retards on the medium tankers? I might actually throw to Tim for that. If oh, that's, Tim, uh, if retards. That's retards. Okay. retards on medium tankers. On a medium tanker. Mm. Um, not that I'm aware of, no. no. So uh, uh, we've got, yeah, we've got manual uh, um, medium tankers and also uh, automatic medium tanker, so I assume he's talking about the automatic, but I'm not sure that, uh, well, I'm not aware of any program to look at uh, retrofitting retarders. Yeah. Thanks, um, and, and Darren, I guess, uh, without a little bit more context, I guess we, I can't explore that question a little bit more for you, but, um, but certainly um, you sort of got a bit of a, bit of a question there uh, now. So we have another panelist here with us this evening. Welcome, Steve, uh, to the panel. And uh, you're here to tell us about a bit of a new initiative that's just been rolled out uh, to assist the, the DMOs and to make, I guess, everyone's life a little bit easier and streamline and bring the CFA into the 21st century. Um, tell me a little bit more about it. Yeah, thanks. So um, we've developed a system uh, down at the Bansdale workshop that is a QR code. Uh, it's on the inside of the windscreen. And basically, it, it's just there for customer service to allow our volunteers that are already time poor uh, to, to re report faults that are of non-urgent nature. So they're the map light that's not working, they're the foam that won't fill. Uh, those are very simple faults that make up probably 95% of our, um, our faults that uh, come through. So uh, just to make it really easy for, uh, for our volunteers to report a fault day or night, whatever time that suits them, mm -hmm. uh, just to make it really easy for them. Excellent. And I understand that uh, you've starred in a little bit of a video production on the, the QR code uh, facility. We, so uh, we might we ask Keith something. to roll the tape. So this is a quick demonstration of how the system works. So the, the QR codes on the inside of the windscreen, normally near the service sticker, uh, you simply scan it with your smart device and it takes you to a, a very simple form where you enter your brigade, uh, the type of appliance, 
uh, your contact details and name, and of course uh, a, a description of the fault, um, so that uh, we we get that at the DMO workshop, and then we can action that. So that can be done, uh, you know, at the middle of the night on the way home from a fire call. It can be done at 10 o'clock at night after training, um, at a time that suits the volunteer, rather than to wait to business hours to uh, to ring the workshop or or send us an email or you know. Um, you know, it, it just makes it very easy for the customer. Mm -hmm. So when I hit submit, what happens then? Um, so you get a, a little screen that tells you that uh, it has been submitted and that we will action that. Mm -hmm. So um, very, very similar to um, if you send an email or uh, ring the workshop, then we'll go through our process. Uh, and that's different at each workshop, whether mm -hmm. we get, get involved to the, uh, talk to, to the captain, send him a text, write in the logbook, put it on the whiteboard to say that we've, uh, we've actually actioned that fault and it's all done. With. So. Uh, awesome. And, and I guess since, um, since rolling it out and we, there was a bit of an announcement, um, I think a couple of weeks ago, two weeks ago, where uh, it was announced that this system was being rolled out across CFA. How many are starting to see roll in from people using the QR code facility? Uh, so at the Bansdale Workshop, all of our vehicles are fitted with the QR code. Uh, Seymour have tried it, uh, Kangaroo Flat are trialling it. So there's a, a few workshops around that are starting to use it, but over the next 12 months, obviously, as Tim said, we've got a lot of appliances that we need to uh, get the code uh, fitted up to. We need our workshop staff to be uh, across how it, how it works and they need to be trained. So it will take a little bit of time before this is completely rolled out across the state. Uh, but we'll, uh, yeah, we'll endeavour to, to make sure it happens within about a 12 month period. Ah, excellent. And Steve, um, again, can't let you off the panel without asking a hard question. And John was always the, uh, the diplomat. It's true, isn't it? If you want to know something, you've got to ask a DMO. Yeah, look, and if we don't know, we'll make it up. Nice. That's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> Finally, the truth has been revealed here right on the panel this evening. A couple of questions still coming in. And I, I guess, yeah, Tim, Steve, feel free to, to jump in here or Anthony, if, uh, if you know the question. Um, so why does CFA not do a full refurb and rebuild of appliances after 15 years of service, given we now have some 30 year plus appliances? Look, I might grab that. Um, so a lot of it's to do with prioritisation around budget. Um, we, we have, um, I think the forum's probably sick of hearing me talk about uh, the $12.6 million a year we get to, uh, to replace um, our, you know, over 2,200 appliances. And uh, effectively, for the last few years, we've had um, we've, we really had an ability, we had no ability to focus anything on anything other than the replacement of, of our heavy tankers, which, as the question states, are, are certainly aging. Um, so the reality for us is that the, the funds just aren't there to, to be able to do that. The trucks are maintained to an exceptional standard by the DMOs, and in many cases, the hours that the pumps, the pumps run and the kilometres that the trucks do just don't justify that sort of level of uh, refurbishment anyway. Um, having said that though, we are, um, and we've spoken about this at some previous um, volunteer forums as well, is we are starting to accelerate our plans around the, uh, around the, uh, the recap chassising of things like our pumpers, which is, which is effectively a refurbishment mm -hmm. uh, of sorts. So retain the back, replace everything else, or retain the back of pump and replace everything else. Um, and, and we can do that in a far more economical way. Um, in fact, uh, we've got our suppliers starting to have a look at, uh, at what they need to do to get that in anger, and we've got the first half dozen cab chassis coming, uh, coming, into, uh, coming into CFA to be able to do that. Ah, awesome. Um, the next question I've got in here is uh, helmet bags. What's the latest with helmet bags? There's a couple of, couple of questions around, around helmet bags, particularly for the new structural helmets. Yeah, we're, um, we're working with our engineering team um, uh, and they're working with, uh, with uh, their oper operational colleagues to uh, come up with solutions for, for starring uh, the helmets, or specifically the uh, structural helmets in, uh, in the vehicles. Uh, it's not a perfect solution, we, we, we acknowledge that. Um, so we're trying to work out as many different solutions as we can to accommodate um, uh, the helmets. Uh, it's like trying to fit five ba basketballs in a cabin and we train them, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. So, um, and we've got, you know, there's a trade off there with all the other equipment in the vehicle. Um, so yeah, we're working, we're working to try and find the best solutions possible. And, and we, we acknowledge that, you know, it's not, it's not perfect. A bit, bit more work to be done. A bit more work to, be, more done. Work to yeah. be done. Thank you. Um, well, and I, I guess one of the things I did wanted to point out uh, now, I, I gotta say, I got, I got one in on the, uh, on the text line. And a big, uh, a big shout out to, uh, to our CEO, Natalie McDonald, who has 
quite rightfully called me out this evening. Uh, boys and their toys, very uh, male chauvinistic uh, saying, so I, I do apologise for that. But that probably leads on to a nice little question, Anthony. Do we have any female DMOs? And if not, why not? And what can we do about it? Right. Um, at, at, present, um, at present, we don't have any female DMOs. Um, we have had um, a number of apprentices come through over the years um, that, have been, uh, that have been female. And it's certainly been very much a focus uh, for us on trying to ensure we get uh, a little more gender diversity into the, uh, into the workforce. There's, uh, you know, plenty of, um, plenty of people of all, uh, of all genders that can do the job and then it can, uh, you know, that could uh, certainly, uh, certainly um, you know, improve that gender balance for us. But uh, at the moment, uh, we're finding it as a, as a bit of a difficult task to, um, to, to both attract and also retain um, a number of those, mm. um, a number of, uh, uh, you know, the, the demos over the mm. journey, so. I guess, you know, in a, in a very male-dominated industry, really, isn't it? Um, yeah, and, you know, 50% of the population, yeah, we really do need to be doing everything we can to, to increase diversity in the CFA, including um, our workshops and, and, and the like, and certainly, I think, um, I'm glad to hear that, um, you know, we, we are encouraging apprenticeships and the like to, to, to increase uh, to increase that, so um, no, that's that's uh, that's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, a couple of other questions here. Uh, we've got. Uh, we'll see. Uh, have CFA looked at building any more BA vehicles similar to Bayswater's that has the capacity to refill on scene? And uh, how are we working towards a swap and go system for all districts? Tim. <laughs> um, as far as I'm aware, we're not looking at building any more vehicles like uh, the Bayswater. There's nothing on the books, no, no, no plans at the moment, um, but it all fits into a more strategic uh, uh, plan of how we service our BAs in the field. Um, and I know I think that Brett Boatman and his team are working in that space to, to identify what the strategy is and then, of course, um, as the fleet team, we'll, uh, we'll support them and, uh, and build whatever's required to be built. Um, to, to meet that capability. Beautiful answer, Tim. And for, <laughs> for everyone out there, if you want to know um, who gets the, the question or put on the spot, after I ask the hard question, I look at everyone's frow <laughs> and see who's broken out into the largest cold sweat. And generally, they're the one I, uh, I select. So um, that's uh, so. another one i got here is, uh, will the BA support vehicles be allocated out to districts rather than brigades? And how do we apply for one through grants, et cetera, to obtain one of these new vehicles? Anthony. Yeah, so the, um, the first two vehicles um, uh, are, district, uh, are district level resources, but to forget me if I'm wrong, Tim, but they are being managed by individual brigades, is that...? Uh... I believe that's the plan, yeah. yes, Anthony, yep. Yeah, so, um, so they are going to brigades. At this stage, um, uh, there's one at district, uh, there's one out of district 16, um, and, uh, and I believe the other one's at district 6 at Cobden, and um, we're using those to trial at the moment and to, uh, and to work through. So. We, we would definitely like we would definitely like to see these as a um, as vehicles we can put onto programs like Vesip and others into the future, um, and a, you know a standard vehicle um, will be available for uh, for brigades as well. But there's there's full intent of um, of, of CFA and infrastructure to roll out uh, to roll out a, a large number of these to support our our, uh, our ongoing BA strategy. Awesome. Um, another another question here in the chat, but uh, but sent through from email. So thank you. And that's uh, can we start the theory training on the new vehicle type, even if we don't have it yet in in our possession? And I think that's a really fantastic question because uh, Anthony, as you know, um, every uh, every well, I guess fortnight, every Friday morning, we have our incident review panel meeting. We discuss actions and outcomes from uh, incidents and uh, and the like across the state. And I know we're looking at. Um, videos and training type material for every single truck type in the fleet. Um, so uh, I guess, how are we going with, uh, with that? And I guess, what are some of the theories, what are some of the things that we're, we're looking to achieve in, in doing that? Um, look, it, it, a lot of it needs to focus on the difference between, uh, between the appliances that are already there versus the, you know, the appliances that are, uh, that, that are coming in. So. Uh, there's been a lot of technological changes between a, a 10 year old, a 20 year old, a 30 year old mm. vehicle and the, and the ones that we're delivering now. Um, uh, you know, so in many cases, and, uh, and given the fact that we don't want to be 
um, you know, taking up a, a whole lot of time with our volunteers for this sort of stuff. We should be focusing on those elements that are the, that are the you know the differences and the and the, and the key changes that people will experience as a part of that. Because I think some of the feedback and some of the learnings from from some of those ICAM investigations was particularly around the service exchange fleet, and more importantly for those coming in from interstate, we're operating on CFA appliances that. Um, you know, the ability to, again, QR code, Steve, you'd be uh, glad to, to hear into, into the future, um, scan and watch a little videoette on you know, the truck, how to use it, some of its key safety features. It's not a full training, but at least it's giving people a bit of an understanding of you know, what the truck is, how to use it, uh, and, yeah, and, and some of the key features uh, of that. So um, keep an eye out for those things. Uh, they are being uh, worked through, and I certainly I know Anthony and the team are, uh, are looking to... Um, to progress those through, and I think it's a great initiative, a safety initiative, to ensure that our members uh, are safe uh, in operating of our, our vehicles. So, uh, still looking for, for, for those questions. I'm not quite sure we've stumped Anthony yet, so uh, we've come close, but I think there's still a few more, few more in there, or uh, if, we, if, we, if, if, if we want to give Anthony a bit of a break, and he's probably hoping we will, uh, let's see if we can uh, stump Tim or, or Steve with uh, some of those uh, curly questions. Um, Anthony, another one, I'm afraid, but probably a good news story, Workwear. Uh, we've had some developments. We have, we have. So, um, so the State Logistics Centre have started to receive um, the, first, uh, the first sets of workwear. So um, we have, uh, we have uh, you know, several thousand garments starting to come into the, uh, into the State Logistics Centre. Um, we, um, uh, we're expecting to receive about a thousand garments a week um, over the course of, uh, of February and, uh, and, through, uh, and through March. Um, so the production of those garments is, is well underway, which is fantastic. Um, we've already received all our stocks of epaulets and belts and jackets and uh, uh, poor Shane had to find somewhere to put 18,000 jackets while we, <laughs> uh, while, we worked through the, uh, while we worked through getting the rest of the garments to start the, uh, start the pick and pack. Um, slight delay on our um, on our headwear. Our supplier tells us that it's uh, sitting in a port in China trying to get on a ship, so we're just uh, we're just working through those. And um, you know we won't let that stop us. We'll uh, we'll start to distribute even if we've got an issue with that. I think most people have probably got a cap, and most people have probably got mm. that sort of stuff to wear in the interim while we uh, while we work through that. Um, probably a good uh, a good ad. The brigade nomination forms to work mm. where are due back in on uh, on February the fourth. Um, we've uh, we've got about 660 or so brigades that have uh, that have sent us um, that have sent us the forms already, and that's uh, that's fantastic. Um, and it's really important that we uh, we get those back because they will give us the uh, the ability to then send out the information to people on how to size, how to you know how to do all those sorts of things to begin the um, to begin the um, to begin the process, which is fantastic. And we we're, uh, we're actually beginning a couple of sizing sessions as well, so. Um, up a, a little bit further north in uh, in 24 and 20, we're uh, we're starting uh, some sizing sessions. We've we've picked up there because um, they're still in response level one, and uh, and we're able to to move around and um, and do some uh, do some work up there. And the uh, and the ACFOs of those two regions have uh, have, have certainly uh, jumped on board and expressed mm -hmm. a lot of interest in this. So that's um, so that's fantastic. We've been doing a bit of work at the State Logistics Centre as well because this is a brand new, uh, brand new lines of clothing um, and uh, we've, we've actually had to build uh, some brand new pick and pack lines so some, some new racks have gone in um, and um, we're getting set up for, for not only this we're also going to use the same rack, uh, the same racking and uh, pick and packing systems for the, uh, for the, uh, the next gen wildfire PPC when that, um, when that uh, starts to roll out later in the year. Um, we're also going to uh, have a few people around at, um, at State Champs up at Marupna as well, so we're looking to get a bit of space in the corporate marquee there and we'll be running through some sizing up there. So, uh, so Stephen Hill, their project manager and his team, will be, uh, will be running through uh, doing some of that. Mm. Take the opportunity while we've got such a large group of, um, of volunteers together in the one place. Mm. So. And I know I went to, to Scoresby, you know, the State Logistics the other day and I did my sizing and I think one of the things that surprised me was what I thought I was, size I was, actually wasn't the case. Mm. And so, you know, if, if you're inclined just to order that normal, you know, if I'm normally in an XL shirt, I'll just grab an XL shirt. Uh, they don't quite, they're not quite the same. So I think I would really do encourage people to make sure that if you do have opportunity to get in and, and get that sizing done, uh, get it done. But otherwise, I think you might end up with uh, some garments that are a little bit bigger than, uh, than what you think they might be. 
Yeah, so um, we're also setting out some instructions on self-sizing, which mm -hmm. is good, and if people follow those. But I don't know about you, mate, but for me, that's uh, that's been a COVID impact around the whole yeah. changing in the sizing. But that's. Uh, is the, you know, I thought it was the dryer; it shrank, shrank my pants. Yeah, 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 yeah. Suit staying in the cupboard too long, you know, all those sorts. All of things. those things, yes. <laughs> awesome. So um, I'm going to give you a break for a little bit, mate. Sure. You, you've been a champion tonight. You've stepped up to the to the questions, Tim. You may or may not know this, so it's all. I'm just trying to give Anthony a bit of a break here. But uh, pumper tanker builds. Pumper tanker builds. We have a pumper tanker prototype that's been completed, and we're um, we're in a phase of uh, doing some further product development with that vehicle at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we're looking forward to getting that to the brigade that's allocated to to get some feedback from them um, from a from a practical point of view. Um, so hopefully that'll happen uh, sooner rather than later, and uh, yeah, and then uh, then from there, I, I, I guess then there'll be a business case around mm -hmm. uh, if we uh, if we go forward with pumper tankers, you know what you know, what they'll look like um, and how many. So yeah, so pumper tankers are certainly uh, certainly a vehicle that our volunteers tell us that they've got a great. Um, our operational people tell us they have a. Um, a, a, a great need for that capability mm -hmm. so yeah looking forward to seeing what we can uh, develop over the coming oh, that's, that's coming awesome year, so. and the, the current prototype is actually in operational service isn't it that's a couple it it, uh, it started uh, and i think it's off uh, having uh, a couple of uh, modifications done to it at the moment but it's a, it's a few weeks away i think from uh, from heading back out again ah, awesome so uh it looks certainly you will you may see the the, the brand new prototype uh, pumper tanker out and about and if you do please uh, feel free to, to stop and uh, have a look at it and, and give your feedback. Steve, mate, you, you didn't escape the questions. It's, it's come through. Um, the question uh, from James, will logging a fault with the QR code generate a notification, email or some other, to relevant BMT at the time of submission for awareness, especially if crew from another brigade using it at the time, i.e. You know, someone's on a strike team, they've logged the fault using the QR code, uh, it cur currently, is the system able to do that? And what's the, what's your thinking for where, I guess, if it doesn't, what might be possible? So that's a, that's a really good question and, um, and a good consideration. But I think at the moment, this is just phase one. Um, so this system does have some limitations. You can't attach photos, which would be really good for both the end user and the demo to pick up what's actually gone wrong, um, which we, we don't have that functionality. Um, and we don't have the, the functionality to be able to close the loop back to the brigade and say that it has been completed. So I think, um, you know, once we get it rolled out, we can have a bit more of a look about what it looks like um, and what our needs are going forward from both the DMO location and also volunteers. They'll, they'll give us some feedback on what it, what it does well and what it doesn't. So I think, um, yeah, let's get it rolled out. Let's see what it does well. Let's see what it doesn't do well. And um, yeah, and we can probably modify it from there, hopefully. It's all about people using the system uh, and then giving that feedback, isn't Absolutely, it? So, yeah. you know, and as we get that feedback in uh, and suggestions yeah. and ideas from, from people and uh, such as the idea tonight allows us to, to develop our systems and, and understand how best we can modify them to, to suit the needs of our, of our most important asset, which is our people. Um, so that, that, absolutely. I think the feedback too, if we can get plenty of uh, feedback on the system, um, as Steve said, it's sort of phase one and it'll help us build a, a case to, to get some um, resources to, to, to develop it a bit more. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think the feedback's really important. Uh, and I, I, I uh, given everything I've heard about DMOs, Tim, I'm pretty sure um, the conversations that'll be had at the, at the side of the truck, I, I'm pretty sure they'll get the feedback that, uh, they, uh, sure they. that they need. Um, Nick asks, why was the Hino 3.C tanker removed from VESIP for brigades to purchase or upgrade older vehicles to? I'll give that a bash. So um, you know, the, uh, the appliance list that's available in VESIP changes from time to time based on demand. Um, I don't know why that specific vehicle was removed, and I, 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 I can't answer that off the, off, the, off the cuff, but I can certainly uh, provide some information around that and I'll go and find out. But, uh, but the reality is, is the vehicles that we... Um, you know, the vehicles that are available under VESA do change over time based on, you know, how many of them we, how many of them are successful, how many of them are needed, what the needs of the organisation are at any given time. So, um, you know, so they do vary. So mm -hmm. vehicles drop off and, and vehicles add on. I mean, we're adding on the, we will be adding on the BA support. Um, so, uh, you know, we do, we do change those lists mm -hmm. from time to time. Awesome. Uh, are we ever likely to see 
an ultralight on a Ranger cab chassis? Uh, the challenge there is uh, is weight, mm -hmm. um, and um, and and uh, our. Our, our people tell us water's, uh, water's really important and um, there'd be a compromise if we were to use a, a Ranger chassis. Um, we push the, the uh, Land Cruiser envelope to its sort of, you know, it's as far as we can, um, as far as we're comfortable to. So Ranger's probably not, uh, not in the same spec. No. Mm. But, but maybe a, a, an alternative spec. Yeah, because yeah, I think one of the important things for us is to, I guess, stay within what the OEM, the original equipment manufacturer, specifies is when we sort of go outside of those parameters, uh, you know, the, the crash testing that they perform and some of the other uh, testing that performs and that they do at the factory, you know, yeah. it tends to become a bit questionable then, doesn't it? It does, and, that, and that's the challenge for us. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's yeah, needing to understand what we're doing to the vehicle and making sure that we don't compromise the safety systems on the vehicle. Hmm. Yeah. No, that's, that's a fair point to be had, as I said, we. Uh, safety is our, our number one priority, and that uh, that is uh, a key point to to be made. Uh, Anthony, you touched on before, and, and please, gentlemen, jump in if you if you got something to add here or no. Uh, you touched on before about the I guess the pumper refurb program, the New South yep. Wales back refurb program. W where are we at with with that? Yeah, so we're um, we're, we're looking to engage the, uh, the the supplier that uh, looked after these for Fire Rescue New South Wales, um, a, a company called Coopers. Uh, Cooper's Engineering, and um, we uh, we actually have a meeting with them uh, next week to uh, to further discuss um, the work that they did for New South Wales. Um, we have um, purchased and taken delivery of the first of half a dozen Mercedes Atigo cab chassis, um, and they'll be used as the uh, as those um, as those vehicles to do that um, to do that trial um, to do that trial refurbishment program um, with. So. Uh, it's moving. It's moving slowly. We've had uh, we've had a lot of delays due to being able to uh, get hold of the cab chassis, mm -hmm. but also be able to engage appropriately with Coopers given the COVID situation around the country. And uh, we're now at that point where you know where we're able to um, we're able to engage more fully with them, and um, and we'll uh, we're starting that uh, starting that next week. Awesome. Um, so another another question here, and and Jamie asks. Uh, yeah, quite, quite fairly, I think. Yeah, we'll see if I ever be inclined to allow support vehicles and FCVs to be moved from one brigade to another that struggles to get funding on the best of days to allow them to get a bit of support. So, when, uh, so I assume we're talking about, um, we're talking about the CFA policies around um, vehicles replaced under VESIP not being able to go to other brigades, you know, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Um, and and the, the short answer is that um, that policy exists for a reason, and that policy exists so that uh, CFA's fleet or, or, the, or the cost of CFA's um, the cost of CFA maintaining its vehicles doesn't just blow out exponentially. Um, and um, the reality is there are um, there are hardship allowances and, and hardship provisions available under under VESA programs. So so brigades can certainly apply for. Uh, vehicles that are um, that are justified, even if they don't necessarily have the ability to raise funds for their contribution. Mm -hmm. So those sorts of things, um, those sorts of things are available. And and I mean the simple the simplest part of the answer is that we're under these programs we're replacing these vehicles because they are probably at end of life. We're replacing them for a reason. So moving them onto another brigade is probably not the most appropriate use for them. Fair enough. Um, again, leading on to uh, on to trucks, a lot of questions in the chat about tanker replacement programs. Yeah, uh, aging tanker fleet or appliance fleet, should I say? Because it is about uh, a couple of questions there about pumpers as well, pumper tankers, support vehicles, uh, yeah. and the like. Now, I understand you're doing a bit of work at the moment around um, some of our strategic asset management uh, approach to, yep. to, I guess, to ensure that CFA is compliant with uh, government policy. Do you want to talk us through a bit about what you're working on and how that information will help us feed into uh, you know, a, a proper program uh, of replacement? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, CFA has been um, been a bit of a, a bit of a victim of, a, of some uh, of some underfunding in this space for a while for our asset replacements. So, effectively, what that means for us is we're we're doing two things at the moment. One is we're, we're sitting down and we're we're actually working through the in a quantitative way, um, you know, what, what is the problem? What do we need? It feeds into the capability work that's also being done, feeds into our asset management plans and feeds into a, you know, a variety of other things that will allow us to, uh, you know, to go to, the, to go to the gates of the Treasury and say, you know, we get X. Um, unfortunately, our need in order to continue to provide our volunteers what they need to do their job is Y. 
um, you know, and being able to mount those, um, being able to mount those arguments. It's, it's starting to work a little more in the, um, the CFA capability funding. We, we managed to get funding to replace 50 of our appliances. That's a, that's a big leap forward. You add that onto the mm -hmm. top of everything else that we're doing. And, and I think this year, Tim and his team are building about 192 appliances, which will you know, start to work through and replace a, a number of those vehicles. We're also looking at things like our refurbishment programs, where we're looking at the, uh, the types of vehicles that we're replacing. So Karen spoke before about the ultra heavy tankers. Um, now 29 of those are coming in. That's not 29 additional vehicles. They will replace um, existing heavy tankers or existing other tankers where the, where the regions and districts have indicated that um, you know, that's, an appropriate, mm -hmm. that's an appropriate replacement. So a, lo a lot of good work being done in, uh, in, in that area. That's, um, that's good to hear. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as promised, uh, the rains are starting to fall here in Corio, so uh, I do apologise if there is a bit of background noise uh, as the thunder and lightning is, uh, is cracking. Um, yeah, it certainly brings back uh, memories of uh, you know, great southern land, um, you know, all the images of, of that on the back of Australia Day, somewhat probably uh, appropriate. Tim, Thanks. question on the chat? Yep. Uh, yeah, legitimate question. Uh, I guess raising a question around you spoke earlier about the helmet bags. Mm -hmm. um, around it, the helmet bags and the heavy tanker, yep. sort of blocking the view for the crew leader and being a bit of a problem. Uh, is that something that's been raised with you? Absolutely, yeah. So we've gotten a lot of feedback about the, the lack of um, situational awareness. Guys sitting in the back, uh, or firefighters sitting in the back have uh, with the helmet bag. So, um, you yeah, know, working with our, uh, with our uh, operational colleagues, um, we're, we're looking at options there. Um, I know that down Steve's way, down, um, down in East Gippsland, they've raised some concerns and, and we're looking at a, a trialling a different um, uh, layout. Um, I guess the challenge for us is, the, you know, if the, all the helmets have to be in the cabin, um, it's, it's, it's really difficult. Mm. Um, I guess it's about, you know, okay, how many do we need to have in the cabin? Uh, can we put them in the lockers? And if so, where can we put them in? Steve's team, I think, uh, you know, looking at a couple of good options. Um, we've spoken with Gary Weir um, about it and Brett Boatman because they've been involved with, uh, with the helmet uh, stowage program. Gary with tankers, Brett with, uh, uh, with pumpers. So we're, you know, I, I think we're, we're in a position to, to, to provide an alternative. Um, yeah, it's, it's, mm. as I said before, it's not perfect. Yeah, look, and it's one of the challenges, isn't it? So yeah. you know, as equipment keeps evolving, you know, new types of equipment, new models, makes, those sort of things. Yeah. It's a bit of a ever moving feast for, you, for, for, for DMOs, isn't it really? You, you just fit the fleet up for one piece of equipment and then they go and change something with it and lo and behold, it doesn't fit in its spot anymore. Um, so you really do have a bit of a job and keeping abreast of all those changes and making sure that we make those modifications, don't we? Absolutely, I think Steve's probably the best place to talk about that amount of modifications you got on the books, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's never ending. Mm -hmm. Tell us all about it, Steve. And helmet bags, I, I guess, they're, they're there for firefighter safety. They're there to secure the helmet um, in case of an accident. So um, yeah, it's a bit of, bit of give and take, I suppose, that it does remove a little bit of visibility, which is, yeah, really unfortunate. Um, and offset in the back of, a, of an IVEC echo tanker, and I agree, it does uh, reduce a lot of visibility. But also, we need to secure those helmets and make sure that the firefighters are safe in case there's an accident. So, that's a big challenge for us to try and make sure that uh, you know we can we can get the both both of both best of both worlds there, mm -hmm. I suppose. So. Um, talk us through some of the other mods that you're working through at the moment. I think there's 29 currently on the list, yeah. um, and they're they're from um, safety improvements to reliability. Um, you know, very, very simple stuff. Um, you know, we've, we've done quite a lot. And we, our engineering team often, um, you know, they'll identify something that can be improved and they'll come to the fleet team and make sure that uh, we've got the capability to do it in a time frame. Um, and we'll, we'll engage with them, work with them and yeah, roll out a, a, a suitable um, yeah, solution to, to make sure that it works. And it's about bringing all the parts together. And I, I see, yeah, Tim, you pointed to the, the, the stack over the back here that everyone, uh, that everyone I guess, uh, watching this can't see, but you know, following a, again an ICAM investigation that was undertaken, some of the recommendations flowing from that, we're now retrofitting uh, appliances with you know high vis, non-slip steps and handrail grips. Yeah. Yep, that's right. And um, Karen was actually uh, 
very much involved from the engineering perspective to, uh, to, to determine the solution for the, for the steps. And the other pallet sitting over there is full of uh, low voltage fuse removal uh, stowage containers. So again, you know, the capability required, um, we needed to stow this equipment on the vehicles. Um, so we had to come up with a solution and you know, the engineering team mm -hmm. working with the DMAs uh, come up with the, the solution. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we're always we're always got um, as Steve said, you know, at the moment it's about 27, um, but there's the modifications all the time, and, and it's all about improving the safety and, and the capability uh, of our, our vehicles for our volunteers. Absolutely, and uh, thanks for Terence for the uh, heads up big storm cell about to hit you uh, warning. I think uh, I think we are starting to see the effects of that. So thanks. Uh, Thanks, Terence. And again, please, uh, we do apologise for some of the, the glitches this evening. Uh, it is as a result of the, the atmospheric instability where we are. Uh, but as I said, it will be available online uh, and you will be able to watch the entire thing ad-free uh, after, after the, uh, the forum this evening. And that has just made me lose my train of thought to my next hard one to, uh, to you, Steve. So, ah, now I've remembered. Back in, back in the day when I was a bolo, um, in my brigade, um, we pretty much put anything and everything on the on the truck anywhere. What's the dangers of doing that? Yeah, that's something we see uh, quite regularly, and it's about compliance. It's about making sure that um, our vehicles are roadworthy and safe. So um, volunteers, they like uh, functionality. They like um, you know their their bits of gear close and easy to access. But sometimes you know that hasn't been thought through 100% or uh, a roadworthy uh, item hasn't been considered in that. Um, and dash cameras are a good thing that we see fairly regularly stuck to the middle of the windscreen and, you know, they inhibit the curtains from coming down in a, in a hurry, uh, which they probably will need to be if, if you ever need to use them. Hopefully that's not the case, but yeah, the last thing you want is a dash cam sitting in the middle of the, the windscreen. Um, and it also inhibits the driver's vision uh, when you're going through intersections mm -hmm. and things like that. So. Uh, whilst they're a good tool for, for volunteers to use in their appliance, um, you know, they've, they've got a repercussion for us as well. So, so they are, so I'm, I'm just going to preempt for two seconds. Let me just channel the audience because I reckon you've just triggered about a thousand questions. So let me ask the question everyone's thinking. There is a proliferation of them out there. Uh, and I know certainly through, uh, I think the trust, uh, the DG Park Trust and, and the like um, more and more. So are we working on a bit of an engineering solution to how we might be able to to fit these uh, dash cams or if the answer is no, is it possible to work <laughs> through an engineering solution? Uh, we're waiting um, primarily on, on a decision on, on the rules around the, the dash cams. Um, so once that comes out, then uh, and as you say, the grants, there's a, there's a number of brigades out there that have been allocated uh, those things. And yeah, we'll have to uh, come up with a solution, but at the moment we're not working on anything at the moment. So. Fair enough. And, uh, I think that's a very nice way of saying it's on your desk, Chief. Um, <laughs> how about you pull it out from the bottom and, and deal with it? So uh, thanks, Tim. No um, and I guess the, the moral of your uh, story, Steve, is uh, you know, we do standard stowage, standard placement for a reason. A, it keeps the vehicles uh, ADR compliant and you know, roadworthy and, and the like, and also assists with vehicle stability. Um, so you know, 100, 100 kilos of chain in an offside locker is probably not the best thing to do. Um, yeah, so, so I think the best thing is um, if, you, if your brigade's considering a modification, talk to the DMO first before you carry it out. And we'll, we can advise on whether that's uh, it's a compliant modification or whether we need to do some work on yeah. that. And, so. and we have a process. We have a, we have a defined um, modification request um, process. And, you know, if, uh, you know, we may have already fitted it up somewhere else in the rest of the state and we might already have a solution. And that standard you know? fitting, yeah, for that type yeah, so, of appliance. Yeah, yeah right. So. Excellent. Um, so look, I think, uh, I think I might just quickly now throw to Brad on the, on the emails. Have we got any questions on the, uh, on the email, Brad? Yeah, we've got one come through for Tim. Uh, Tim, in regards to correspondence about when DMOs are on site and some feedback is flagged, there's been moments where they've been unaware of a DMO being at their premises uh, and, and, and to attend uh, to service. And, and it's also conversations in regards to open communication in regards to uh, matters in regards to vehicles, any, anything that needs to be attended to. So I guess it's a conversation about the open correspondence about when DMOs are on site and likewise Tim in regards to awareness about when we have issues with vehicles or, or parts of the fleet. Yeah, thanks Brad. I think um, this one we well, 
well handled by Steve, um, so I handball it to him. But look, yes, that, that, that closing the loop, making sure that um, we communicate with uh, with the brigades is, is really important. And, and we have slightly different processes around the state, but Steve's probably better. Than most uh, most EMOs make every effort to um, to make contact with someone from the brigade um, to ensure that you know they know we're coming and um, and all we've, we've fixed it, ordered parts, and um, and keep our customers in the loop with what we're doing. But uh, you know the workload sometimes you know that doesn't occur for whatever reason. Um, or we might not want to uh, annoy a captain in the middle of the day when they're they're, they're busy doing their own stuff. So. Uh, yeah, we can probably take that on board, I guess, and, and improve yeah. some of our processes. That's and I think, yeah. Um, um, yeah, life happens and things get busy and, and that sort of stuff. So I think that's generally acknowledged by, uh, by our people. And, you know, they've heard it here tonight that, you know, that the DMOs do see brigades as their customers and, you know, they want to do the right thing, right thing by them. And I think um, you spoke before, Steve, about, you know, some of the technology increases, some of the things, and perhaps uh, in the future looking at, you know, the, um, almost like a service type application that does notify a brigade you know, when, when, the, when it's received, when a DMO has been scheduled, you know, all those sort of things is what's possible. Um, and I guess you know, we need to be looking at you know, the use of technologies to allow us to, uh, to be able to facilitate that. So I think they're, they're, they're some of the things that um, we could probably turn our, turn our minds to in the future. But, I, um, but thanks for, for raising that uh, on the email. I think it's, it's very valid uh, and you heard it here tonight. Um, the DMOs love to look after their, their customers. And again, from what I'm seeing in the chat, uh, the customers love, love you. So, um, Anthony, service exchange vehicles. A question here about uh, any plans to increase the quantity and uh, spread of them moving forward? I guess in particular, the pumpers. Yeah. Um, what's your thoughts to that one? Look, pumper service exchange vehicles have always been, uh, have always been an issue for us. Um, Recently, we've, uh, we've actually lost a couple of service exchange vehicle pumpers out of the fleet uh, because we got to the point where there was a, a specific need in, in a number of brigades and uh, uh, the decision was, was taken, um, uh, you know, the operational decision was taken to redeploy uh, a couple of those pumpers into brigades, which, is, uh, which has further exacerbated the issue. Our, our DMOs are very good at, uh, at, at servicing or trying to, trying, to, um, trying to manage the servicing so that we can you know, where possible, manage things within the within the uh, the service exchange vehicle availability. But the problems often come when we have um, when we have issues that are that are unplanned or, or, or you know or, or or reactive maintenance. So, you know, we, we, we do the best we can to manage um, to manage those vehicles. Um, a pumper is a very expensive piece of kit, and uh, unfortunately, we don't have the luxury of having uh, of having enormous numbers of them sitting around um, waiting for. Uh, you know, waiting for them to be required as a service exchange vehicle. But, um, you know, all I can say is that the guys do a great job managing them as, uh, you know, the best they possibly can. And, uh, and um, you know, like everything, we unfortunately have some limitations. Well, members, uh, as the rain steadily roll in, I'm sure the sound crew are, are, are desperately listening to the rain. Um, I think the weather has beat us, ladies and gentlemen, so we might just wrap up tonight's forum uh, on that note. Please thank, uh, thank the panel. Uh, thank you for coming along. Anthony, thanks for being a champion as always. I always throw out the challenge. Uh, I know sometimes it must, uh, it must annoy you, but again, you've stepped up, you've asked the, answered the hard questions, and uh, I think our members are, are gratefully appreciative of that. Uh, again, it will be available on members online to be able to watch the video. Uh, after, after this uh, event. Likewise, when the, when the video did drop out for a little bit, uh, you will be able to see uh, what, what didn't go to air, uh, even the bloopers uh, included. So please watch, watch back afterwards for, uh, to see what, uh, what happened on the, uh, on the panel here this evening. Always keen for feedback. So if you do have feedback on tonight's forum or feedback in general with what you want to see, uh, whether it be on the panel discussing issues or what part of the state, whether it be Brigade, another, uh, another CFA facility, an insight into what it means to be in the CFA, please send that through, internal comms at CFA. Ladies and gentlemen, the rain has completely bid me, and I bid you good night, thank you, and thank you for watching this evening.